sure y'all are well aware of the Oklahoma cotton scene, or if you're not, it's, it's spreading, whether you like it or not, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more popular. And so I don't have a lot of data to show you about cotton in the Oklahoma Panhandle, because we really don't have a whole lot. Uh, and this is going to be a very general talk uh, that hopefully we just kind of go over some few, uh, a few things that help. We, uh, us understand what we need to do uh, in terms of cotton production in this area. So if you're not familiar with cotton, uh, it's, a, it's a perennial tree crop that we're trying to grow as an annual crop. It's, it's indeterminate. It's, it basically is a very challenging crop to try to produce in, in many environments. But when we have a short season environment like we have here, uh, there's a few more things we need to take into consideration. So if you talk to a lot of folks from other areas, they say there's no way you can grow cotton north of I-40. Well, we've been doing that for a while. There's no way you can grow cotton in the Panhandle, Oklahoma, or in Kansas. Well, we've been doing that for a while, too. There are some things that are not beneficial to our environment for cotton production that other folks have, longer seasons. But there's also some things we have that are beneficial to cotton production, uh, which actually help us out in this, in this environment. So really, I'm going to mainly focus on earliness. So when we talk about Cotton in the southwest, uh, outside of South Texas really, most places that we're producing cotton, we're trying to enhance maturity or, or uh, enhance earliness to some degree. And the further north we go, the more that becomes important. So there's some cultural practices that we can do, just basic agronomic stuff that we can, we can do to help with, with that uh, maturity. There's some inputs. Uh, and it's not really just doing these things, it's, it's how we do these things and when we do these things that can help with, with maturity and earliness. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit of late season management, because uh, that can be a challenge too in this environment. So when we talk about cotton, uh, one of the things you're going to hear about is DD60s or heat units. You hear about that all the time. And, and so if you've grown other crops, you, you may use those. I'll just tell you, I really don't know a whole lot about other plants. I'm kind of a one crop person. Uh, but I know there's some DD60s, or heat units, I'm sorry, used in corn. So in, in cotton, it's probably pretty similar. Uh, we use these to kind of map out where we think we should be in a given year, uh, depending on how many heat units we've accumulated at that point in time. And all the heat unit is, is we take the max daily temp plus the minimum daily temp, divide it by two, subtract 60, and that's our accumulated heat units, or it's average daily temp uh, divided by two. If we look at a typical heat and accumulation calendar, so 20 to 25 per day, it's kind of peak. And I'll just say that I'm, I'm kind of a fan of capping heat units. Uh, I don't know if we should give credit when it's over 100 degrees. I don't think cotton likes that. Uh, we talk about cotton being heat tolerant and drought tolerant, and it, and it is compared to other crops. It doesn't mean it loves 100 degrees in, in dry weather. It's a plant. It still needs the same things a lot of the plants need. Uh, but nonetheless, 20 to 25 per day during June, August depends on your cap. Uh, is what we will see a lot. Uh, Y'all know this better than I do. There's, there's, there's dips in temperature in the northern part of the state and in Kansas where when I look at heat units from different stations, we can have days in July where we accumulate seven heat units a day. That's not typical to a lot of the other places in the Cotton Belt. If we look at the end of the season, mid-September, we may be accumulating less than 10 per day. And you can see here this table talks about really what we use heat units to map. And so it's got all these different growth stages or different transitions, how many days on average it takes and how many heat units we need to accumulate. Uh, so you see from plant to emergence, which is probably the most important part of this whole table, we need 50 to 60 heat units. We hope to accumulate those four to nine days. And, and really I'd say we hope to accumulate those in four to seven days. The, the, the quicker the better, especially here where we could have five days of, of good heat units and we could follow it up with a freeze uh, out of nowhere. And so getting that crop established is, is key, and the quicker we can do it, the, the less risky it is. Um, but there's, there's some key factors that are missing when we talk about heat units. And again, it's, it's a plant, and so there's, there's other things that, that, that factor in to growth and development, not just heat, and it's sunlight and water. And I would say that I would rather have an 88 degree day that's fully sunny in the middle of the year than a 95 degree day that's cloudy. Uh, I think we can't take away the, the other benefits or the factors that, that promote growth. And so 
we got to understand that heat units are great. It's a good tool to use, um, but they're not the end-all, be-all uh, way to look at uh, cotton development. But it's the best tool we have now. So we, we had a meeting yesterday in Hooker, so I did this, I did this uh, chart for uh, Hooker, Oklahoma on that, on that mesonet station, uh, where I went and, and did a 10-year average, so 2009-2018, and then just looked at 2018, because when we, when we talk about weather, we usually talk about what happened last year. And it's hard to remember much past that, because that's so stuck in our mind what happened last year. Uh, so if you look at the average over 10 years compared to, uh, to 2018, you can see that for most months we, we were pretty close to average. We accumulated, in general, what we'd expect on a heat unit scale. And I throw April in there, and, and I'll say that I don't think we should start cotton season April 1st. Uh, as, as gutsy as I like to be and as stupid as I like to do you know, some things sometimes, I don't know if April 1st plant date's the smartest agronomic decision we can make. But I will say, I don't think a late April planting date is the craziest thing I've ever heard of either, in this, especially in this part of the world. We've, we've got, if you're planting several thousand acres of cotton, you've got to start sometime. And better start at, the, at late April than, than maybe mid to late May. If you look at last year, you see May was pretty, pretty good to us on the heat unit in the things, but does anybody remember what May was like last year? It's pretty dry. So we got a lot of heat. If you've got that crop established, you're probably okay. But if you plant in a dry soil and that soil stays dry, you're probably not going to have much of a crop at all. And so if you're irrigated, this is actually not that bad. Because I hope I can get a, a, a good seed bed, moist seed bed established, get some good growing conditions early, and capitalize on that heat. And the, the more heat we get during May, the more vigorous that early season growth is. And hopefully, the quicker we can get into our reproductive growth. I really want to focus on the back end of this, August, September, October. So to go from a white flower, which is basically the first stage we have of, of, of a square when it opens, it's a white flower on day one, to an open bowl with hopefully mature, high quality fiber, we need 850 to 950 heat units. So I feel pretty confident that if I open a white flower in mid-July, I will probably accumulate enough heat units to produce an open bowl, hopefully sometime in late September. But if I have a white flower that opens on the last day of August, I'm accumulating on average 350 plus another maybe 70 heat units, and that's just not enough time. And if you've ever grown cotton, you know how nice it looks to have a field of cotton that's all wide open. There's nothing better in the world than a wide open field of cotton. Probably ain't going to happen if that white flower opens on September 1st, though. And so there needs to be, I guess, some reality in, 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 in when we look at the crop late season and what we can realistically get to mature. And I know in Amarillo, we typically said that August 15th was a last effective bloom date. And I think that's probably a, a pretty good rule for us here um, as, we, as we move north. So when we think about some pre-plant management, uh, some of those inputs we talked about. There's a few things we can, we can look at. Um, so kind of going back to that calendar, so talk about seeding rates. We talk about factoring seeding rates and yield potential and how to make money on all this stuff, but I think what we also need to think about is, is the environment we're planting into. And uh, I'll show some data in a little bit, um, but I think we need to have an established goal in mind. So there's a few things we can kind of map out before we even start the season. I know it takes, hopefully if I get good emergence, I know it's probably gonna take me 60 days, maybe 55 days, maybe a little bit earlier, depending on the variety, to get from established stand to our first bloom. So there's two months right there. And I know it takes another potentially two months to go from that bloom to an open bowl. So there's four months. And so I, I think we need to have in mind, when do I wanna start flowering? And maybe base my planting date off it, with the caveat that we don't wanna plant they're in poor conditions. And so I guess the issue is when I look at the heat units, it's obviously it's possible to grow cotton here. It's not impossible. People are doing it all the time. They're doing it really well. But I do think compared to other places, our plant window is not nearly as wide. And so we need to be a little more selective, but also understand the schedule that plant's on, that there's a little bit we can do to adjust that, but there's not a lot. Variety selection, I kind of did this to burn myself. You should base variety selection on local data. I don't have any local data for you. I haven't never, I've never done a variety trial in the Panhandle, Oklahoma. Never done a variety trial outside of Altus, Oklahoma, to be honest. 
So we've got to get more variety data uh, for this area. And I'll say until that point, there's obviously data available from, from companies that have plots in these areas. And so rely on the data you can get. It's, their data is just as good as ours. Um, they don't compare across you know, other companies, obviously, but if you're in a certain trait package, then you can look at varieties that are in that trait package and see how they perform in this area. There's a few things I think we do need to, to think about in terms of maturity class. We're probably more narrowed down to that earlier end of things, obviously. Maybe on dry land you can get into the mids. It really depends on how it performs. Um, but obviously whatever we select on our maturity doesn't mean we can just manage it however we want. We still need to manage varieties to enhance earliness too. And then early season vigor is going to be key. We don't want something that's going to hang around and take forever to put on four to five leaves. Uh, we need to get it kind of up and out of the ground pretty quick. So another input, our management practice is talk about planting date. And I don't want y'all to get really tied up, and I probably should have just taken the dates, actual dates off of here. Uh, but this is some data from, from Lubbock, I guess that was a couple of years ago now, where we looked at planting at different dates and different populations. And I'm not going to talk about the population part because it didn't have an effect, but, but planting date did have some interesting impacts. And so again, don't take the dates too literal. I'm just kind of showing this as, as Cotton's response to a, a, an environment. So when we plant earlier, obviously it's going to be cooler conditions. I'll tell you, the soil moisture wasn't limited, so that's, it was mainly a, a, a heat factor that, that uh, played a role. So the earlier we planted, the less stand we had, the less established we had. We wait until June 9th, great conditions, good heat units. We get a lot of plants out of the ground. So cotton, though, is kind of known for compensating. And you can see here um, that we compensate for that lower population. We put more bowls per plant. Also. Nothing that's you know, unknown. This is no groundbreaking deal. If you've, if you've seen a cotton field, you go to the very end of a row, that plant is kind of by itself. It puts on like 60 bowls, and then it gets on the cover of a seed catalog the next year. I mean, it's pretty common. So you give it room, it's going to put on bowls. It, it compensates for space. And that's really just what we're showing here is that you, know, you give it some space, it's going to compensate. But what's interesting to, to me, and, and you'll see in a minute why, is that we, don't, we still see quite a few bowls there on that middle planting date. So there's not really a difference there. And so maybe I didn't say this, this was, so this is 2017. And uh, 2017 was a, a fairly challenging year uh, for West Texas on quality uh, because we had some, some cotton that got probably planted. It was a pretty popular year to plant late uh, because 2016 was so dang easy. And uh, in 2017, we got more of a normal October. And you can see here that when you get more of a normal October, it can really penalize for that late planting. Uh, it even penalized this, which, was, which honestly was surprising to me. Uh, but, but really, I don't want to get too caught up on the yield numbers. I want to talk more about this, and this is really what drives everything. So these are heat units accumulated in, in the season. The black bar is uh, heat units to be accumulated from, from planting to first bloom. And so it's all about, if you think about it, the, the best thing to do is get yourself into a situation where you've got a good stand that you're happy with and you can maximize that part of the bar. That's really the key. That gives you that, the most time under that effective bloom, blooming window or effective flower window and we're hopefully accumulating, accumulating heat units that are turning flowers into fiber and not just plants into taller plants. And this is just kind of a visual of that. That middle four rows was planted May 12th, May 31st and, and June 9th. And, Obviously, anytime you pass the cotton field and there's more brown than white out there at the end of the year, it's not going to be a good, good harvest. Um, so, a couple other things I want to focus on on the, on the input side of things. I'm trying to run out of time here. I don't usually do a 20-minute talk, so just tell me when I'm done. A um, few things that are going to help with earliness, too, are, are controlling pests. So, weed control is a big one. Obviously, weeds are going to compete with that crop directly for everything that crop wants. And cotton's not very competitive, so most of the weeds we have are going to outcompete cotton. So herbicide program is key. And understand that it's, it's going to be a multi-step process. And uh, we may start pre-plant with yellows. And this all depends on where you're at and what you're doing. Uh, at plant with, with whites or some sort of burn down, we've got emerged plants. Post applications, we're going to usually probably need more than one. Uh, rotating chemistries. We, we don't need to talk about resistance management. I think we all know we've got issues with that. Um, I also think we need to understand that the reason that we're growing cotton in some of the areas that we're now growing cotton in is because we have new traits that have allowed us to do that. And it may even be more so that those traits have allowed us to survive in areas that maybe wouldn't be as cotton friendly as they are now. 
but we don't need to put so much pressure on those traits that we only have them in the system for three or four years before we start overusing them and we're up in that selection pressure. So I'm a huge fan of residuals, whether it's going out with yellows or whites or putting it in the tank every time we make an application. It's going to help us take the pressure off these new products that are allowing us to do what we're doing now with cotton. Uh, this may be a dirty word to some, but you can use tillage as weed control too. Don't, don't shoot the messenger. But if, you, if you're not in a no-till system or you're in some other sort of system, tillage, it can be a great tool for weed control. The big one to me though on the insect side of things is thrips. And I'm not saying that's the only insect y'all gonna have problems with, but when we talk about enhancing maturity and, and, and affecting maturity, thrips can do a, an awesome job of delaying maturity in the crop. So when we get the cod leading cotton, which is right here, we get that first true leaf coming out. That's a great time period to make an overspray of some sort of insecticide, and, and our, we're usually going to turn to acephate for the application. And so our seed treatments do have some thrips uh, products in them, but we usually think those run out. I usually like to use 15 to 18 days after planting. Just I'm conservative. Some folks probably tell you they go a little bit longer, but I don't want to lapse in that window of control. I want to overlap that window. And if I can get a spray on there, I feel pretty good that I can get myself to the four to five leaf stage, at which point those plants are usually big enough and have enough leaf area on them that they can take a little more, carry a little more thrips pressure than they can early in the season. Just look at the cotton in this, in this row and this row. That's not, that's not photoshopped, that's 36 inches apart, and that's thrips pressure. That's the effect thrips had on that crop. And that, that's gonna delay maturity. That's in South Georgia, where we don't really have uh, a short season, but even that can be detrimental. We put that in this environment, and it's gonna be a huge problem. Super quick on the other inputs. Uh, squaring management, uh, we talked about flower too. That's when our inputs kind of start. Uh, up until that point, we don't really need a whole lot in terms of water and fertility, but we got a pretty tight window for fertility applications. Water, we're usually gonna start irrigating during squaring. This up the top is a nitrogen use curve. This on the bottom is a water use curve. You can see how similar they are. A lot of the curves for other nutrients are going to look at that same pattern. Uh, we need to understand that we're going to peak, at peak bloom with our water use, also with nitrogen needs, but we want to get all that fertility out early. We don't want to be back here putting out fertility. We don't want to be up here putting out fertility, at least big shots. If you need to make some sort of a foliar micro shot, that's one thing. If you're putting out 60 pounds of nitrogen right here, you're going to have a bad time. And that really goes for wherever you are, uh, but especially in a short season environment. With water, it's insanely important that we match this curve. We don't want to get up here and flatline all the way over to the end of the season. We want to match that water use curve to maintain uh, an optimal water supply for the crop, but not excess that's going to lead to way too much growth late in the year. So kind of the same deal for flowering. They're just kind of talking about the different growth stages where it peaks but also drops off. Um, we, don't, we don't really see a whole lot of growth, vertical uh, vegetative growth on the back side of that curve if we've got good fruit retention. Growth regulation is always a concern, so we'll cover that real fast. A few things we can do that may uh, uh, impact our, our PGR decisions. Variety selection, the earlier variety typically with good fruit retention. Uh, the less need we have for PGR is not always true, but just kind of a general rule. Uh, understanding water, uh, whether it's irrigation or rainfall. And remember, PGRs can't shrink a plant. We can't impact what's already there, but if we have a rain coming and we can get it out ahead of the rain, we can have an impact. Um, fertility, same kind of thing, timing and rate. We want to meet that use curve. This right here is the biggest one though, fruit retention. Two things that can affect fruit retention, there's a lot of things, but two of the big ones, environmental stress, heat stress, water stress. If we shed squares, we're going to have a little more potential for vegetative growth when that stress is relieved. And then insect pressure. So hopefully we don't have plant bug issues up here, uh, but anything that feeds on fruit and loses, causes the plants to lose fruit is gonna have the same impact as an environmental stress, um, except in real time we'll probably see a response in growth. Uh, so quickly on end of season management, so now we're at the end. Uh, a lot of our products we spray as harvest aids are hormonal products, meaning they are gonna function better when the plants are functioning better. So really redneck way of saying when temperatures are good and high, our products are gonna function a lot better. Prep. Folex, most of our products, Genstar, a lot of our products we apply, even though they're not straight hormonal products, tend to work better in warmer temperatures. 
Uh, fiber development maturity is largely driven by photosynthesis. Uh, so going back to that, uh, that DD60 accumulation graph, be aware of where we're at on that graph and where we're at on the calendar. And if I see a small bowl, do I really think I can afford to wait for that thing to open before I, I hit you know, my harvest aid shot? So there was some work done in Lubbock a few years ago. It was Randy Bowman and, and uh, John Wanera did some of this work. And uh, the only other thing I've found similar to this money tree graph is from Mississippi. And so I think Lubbock probably is a little more reflective of us than Mississippi is. Probably not directly, but the key thing to understand is the money in this crop is generally going to be right in here. These first position bowls in the lower to middle part of the plant. That's what I want to manage. So when that end of the season comes and I'm up here waiting for this $3 bowl per acre to open, I'm probably losing money down here on all my actual money bowls. So let's not sacrifice this right here to have that nice postcard looking cotton with that little bowl up there that's wide open. It's probably not going to be a good return on our investment. So we want to manage to make money. That's why we're growing cotton. I know it's fun. It's not that fun. <laughs> but we want to make money. And so we've got to manage where our money's at on the plant. So that was like, that's growing cotton in, in 15 minutes. I'm sure we're, there's no questions, but in case there are, I'll be glad to take them. All right, well, y'all got some really good growers up here. Y'all don't need me to tell you all this stuff. There's some folks in this room that know this way better than I do and have been doing it already. So please understand that there's folks in here that are, that are doing this and are making it, making it work. So good luck.